that like that. Come on. The program is Eastwatch. I'm Joseph Miller. The Cleveland Museum of Natural History is one of the resources and treasures of the Cle greater Cleveland area. One of the many interests of the museum is in archaeology, particularly archaeology in the Cleveland area. This is a conversation with Dr. David Bros, who is the chief curator of archaeology for the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. And we're focusing in this program on the developments in the near west side and downtown area, focusing on the Irish settlements in Cleveland. Dr. Bros, I guess I should ask you, why did you decide to look into this particular project? Well, we began by looking for prehistoric archaeological sites in the city of Cleveland. And while we found some, we found a lot more historical archaeological sites, sites that went back to about the beginning of the 19th century. One of the missions of the museum is to talk about the relationship between the environment and, and our society. Mm -hmm. And so it seems very appropriate to begin looking at those changes that took place in the development of Cleveland. So you really focused primarily on, uh, among other places, on the near west side. Your, your, your work is on now on the near west side and in the downtown mall area. That's right, for two very different reasons. We began working on the west side, especially right along the western edge of the Cuyahoga River, because it was an area that had not been developed or built up after the community that had lived there moved out in the late 19th century. Uh, we're working downtown in Mall A for very different reasons because it is an area that's going to be uh, destroyed really in the process of some urban redevelopment. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about each one of these d areas uh, separately and distinctly. Give us a little brief background thumbnail history of the area and the time that you are lo you're working in. Well, the, the work we're doing on the west bank of the river is in an area that has become known as Irish Town Bend. Uh, it's the area that many of the Irish living in Cleveland in the flats, in the northern part of the flats, moved to as the Ohio Canal began to make the western end of the flats too much a commercial property. About what time are we talking We're about? We're talking now? about 1835, 1840. Now that area is known to many people in the Cleveland area as kind of the angle. Is that right? The, well, the, I got the, that wrong? The angle is the area right up around the powerhouse uh, where Nautica is mm -hmm. today. Irish Town Bend is a little bit farther up the river. It's between the Columbus Road Bridge and what is now the Detroit Tell Superior you what, we, you brought along some slides from your work and let's let's do a little show and tell here oh, for I'm a few minutes. To. And what are we looking at now? Well, we're standing at Irish Town Bend looking across the river. The rapid tracks are in the background, terminal tower behind that. The truck's moving north along what's today called uh, Riverbed Road, which mm -hmm. used to be called West River Road. And beyond that, you can see the Cuyahoga River. We have a number of people out here clearing away the brush to begin our excavations. So those, those, those uh, figures down at the bottom are your people clearing out? Those are my people. Okay, That's right. fine. Museum volunteers and students. All right. Uh, this is a map from 1898 showing a portion of Irish Town Bend. You can see the river along the right-hand side of your screen, uh, and then some of the streets that are now Ohio City. But you can also see a railroad track running parallel to the river, and that railroad track ran right along the edge of Irish Town Bend. Now, another way to look at this is to look at this map that you brought along, and if you let's just take a second and, and open this up, and you can okay. see by bringing in the camera very close here. This is, this is an aerial view of Cleveland done in 1877 as if you were floating off the lake. Okay. Uh, you can see the mouth of the Cuyahoga River, the river winding up here at this point. And this area along the west side is what used to be called Irish okay. Town Bend. If you can move your hand out of there, the viewers will see a little closer. Okay, we're talking here about up in through this area That's right. right here. You can see a number of very small shacks and shanties uh, because there was a great deal of prejudice against okay. the Irish in the 19th century. Now, another area before we pass on that you're also okay. excavating is in the mall. Show us what this looked like in the, about the late 1800s. Okay, this is the Old Stone Church. This sort of open grassy area is the eastern side of Public Square. Wood Street is now East 3rd, and there used to be a little court called Teresa Court that came across here. The War Memorial Fountain is presently standing on the mall about where this little horse and wagon are okay. shown in this picture. Okay. Now, now we have a perspective here. Now tell us a little about what you've, what you've found in, in your research, particularly on the, around the Bend area. Well, we found that the older maps, the first set of maps, didn't describe anything in this area. It was simply called shacks. But we began looking at the later maps, measuring off the distances for the house corners, 
and we started excavating where we thought we would run into the edges of various buildings. Because of the railroad along the river and the steep bluff behind, as the Irish community moved out of Irishtown itself in the late 19th century, nobody moved back in. So the houses were abandoned, uh, they fell in on themselves, they burned, and by 1910 or 1920, there was almost nobody living there. But in 1860, there were 80 houses, and there were stores, there was a brewery, and we began looking at this as an area in which we could find one very tight ethnic community with known period of occupation to see how they lived in Cleveland. What did they do? Could we talk a little about that ethnic community in general? The Irish at that time were pretty heavily discriminated against they in were. most parts of America, including in Cleveland. Absolutely. This is the period during which there were signs that said, help wanted, no Irish need apply. And the APA, the American Protective Association, uh, which was an anti-Irish group, was That's prominent right. at that time. That's, it was a, a bad time. So when you describe the area as shacks, I get the impression in my mind's eye of kind of ramshackle sorts of places. Well, who lived here? Give us a well, little bit. Well, actually, who lived here were primarily first-generation Irish from 1850 on, and then second-generation Irish into the 1890s. Then they moved out. By 1890, there were a few Eastern Europeans moving into the area. They were Hungarians and, and Czechs primarily, and they lived there to work at the nearby industries, the chief one of which was a brewery. Mm -hmm. uh, but by 1919, the breweries closed with prohibition, and everybody moved out of the area. By 1950, there were two houses standing, and today there's nothing but grass. So, so we saw that picture before. There was that's essentially right. just a plain field, that's basically. Correct. That's right. And that's what it, that's the result of evolution, in effect. What's the result of knocking down houses and not building anything <laughs> on top of them? I'm not sure that's evolution. Now you have some pictures, some slides that describe a little more about some of those homes. Could we? Well, take they show some of the things we found. Absolutely. Uh, this is the corner of a house owned by a man named John Connors. We go to the census and the tax records. And so we have a very good picture of what these families were like, who they were, what jobs they had. And our field supervisor, Al Lee, is the one who does the measurements and goes out and starts the excavations. This is to show how accurate we are in terms of using mm -hmm. those old maps, or mm -hmm. else that both we and the old surveyors are off. Mm -hmm. uh, this is out back of a house that was owned by a policeman named John Quinn. And this is a huge trash pit where things were burned. And then later, sometime after 1870, the trash pit was filled and two huge blocks of sandstone were placed there. The only other place in the city that we see blocks of sandstone this size is in the supports for the Superior Viaduct. Mm -hmm. So it's likely that Officer Quinn or one of his friends borrowed a couple of stones from this construction project, <laughs> brought them in here, used them to fill in an early trash pit, and then used them as the base for a set of steps running up the hill toward Franklin Place. Would you be able to identify approximately uh, what time period we'd be looking at or exactly what Well, time the period? top edges of that uh, set of stairs were filled with ceramics and objects made in the 1875 to 1880 period. Everything below the stones is 1865 to 1870. So 1870 to 75. I see. Again, so you've got this pretty clearly dated. Very clearly what are we looking dated. at now? Well, we're looking at the shacks that are the, or the shanties that Irish Town was reputed to have. And you're looking at the basement of one of these little shacks. Uh, this was a building owned by Mary Connolly, a, win a widow with three children. And this is probably 1855 to 1865. Mm -hmm. You can see dressed stone foundations, mm -hmm. well-laid brick floors. This is a better constructed house than many of the structures we've dug up in Ohio City or in the east side of Cleveland, which nobody called shacks. Mm -hmm. So really what you're saying is that she must have had some fairly wealthy background or some fairly well, wealthy Oh, we know support. quite a bit about her, as a matter of fact, and she was one of the poorest people who lived oh, really? in this area. What Despite the well-constructed home. What I think we're looking at is the prejudice shown against the Irish in the late 19th century. What do you mean? Well, these are shacks because they're Irish that live it there. If they were living in those same houses, in Ohio City, they would be called two-story frame structures. I see. Because we can see from some of the photographs that were taken in the 18, I'm sorry, in the 1910 period, when a few of these houses still stood, that they look exactly like all of the other single and duplex houses in Cleveland. Very interesting. Now, you found a number of artifacts out of that, too. We found a lot of artifacts. This is an 1880 Indian head penny. And this is the sort of object that when we find it lying in the ground, we have a very clear date about the time that mm -hmm. those layers were deposited. Mm -hmm. There are not a lot of coins here because people tend to pick up coins when they drop them. Okay. Uh, this is a bottle, a medicine bottle. It's from the Kiefer Druggists. Kiefer Drugstore was at that point located 
on 25th and Lorraine, which is basically where Kiefer's restaurant is today. I was just going to suggest that, sure. That's right. Uh, and what we're looking at is the way these Irish used the neighborhood, and they used the economy of Cleveland in ways that were really somewhat different. Mm -hmm. This is a range of the kind of imported ceramics. Most of the china that people considered very nice was coming from England in the 1860s and 1870s. These are some examples of the kind of decorated ceramics that the English produced. We found a few of these in Irish Town Bend. In other parts of the city, when we excavate 19th century sites, most of the decorated ceramics and most of the imported ceramics are from England. And they tend to have been made so cheaply that they were often cheaper than ceramics made in eastern Ohio at the same time. And this is one of the Ohio pieces. This is a very nice piece of whiteware. It's made in East Liverpool, Ohio, down on the Ohio River. It's, uh, it was locally available because of the communications through the canals and lakes mm -hmm. and the railroads. The English material was cheaper than the eastern Ohio pottery in the 1870s and 1880s. So this, this is uh, an expensive piece, in effect. It's a reasonably expensive piece, and I think it's interesting that when the Irish living in Irish Town Bend in Cleveland wanted fancy pottery, which they occasionally did to show and to have dinners on and to invite their neighbors in to see them using. The stuff they bought for tea sets, for serving tea, was made in eastern Ohio, even though it cost them more. I think you're seeing the reaction to the English suppressions of, of Irish sure. nationalism. These are just some of the clay marbles. We're able to look at the different kinds of materials found in these different sites and match them up with how many children there were and how many adults there were, mm -hmm. because there are some differences in sites depending on who was living there. Sure, I understand. Uh, this doesn't look like much, but what it is is the bottom ring and some of the bottom sides of a silver tankard. This was a large and obviously very expensive mm -hmm. piece. Mm -hmm. This belonged to Officer Quinn. Mm -hmm. Officer Quinn was one of the more upwardly mobile of the, of the Irish town occupants in the 1870s Would that 80s. be because he was a police officer? Well, that's, that was a very high status position for an Irish immigrant mm -hmm. to have that's in the That's exactly 1870s. what I had in mind, sure. Exactly. And you have a, uh, go ahead. Well, this is interesting because it shows that even in the 1870s, the Irish were interested in more than simply making their way in the world. Somebody in this community was interested enough in the earlier occupants to go out and dig up one of the prehistoric arrowheads that the Native Americans mm -hmm. had made. Mm -hmm. Now you have a picture you brought along in the book here oh, as well of Officer Quinn and let's I see can if we can that. open that up and you can show us exactly where that is. Yeah, this is John Quinn who joined the city of Cleveland Police Department on the 16th of May in 1871. And he remained a policeman and lived in this neighborhood till 1903, at which time he died. Now, and you it, tend to think of, of the police at this particular time period as primarily Irish. Is that the wrong impression to, to think of? Well, it's not. It, it is the wrong impression. Most of the police in the Cleveland force were not Irish, but the Irish, considering the numbers that lived in Cleveland, were disproportionately represented. So he would be then an upwardly mobile, as you said before. Very much, very much. To have started out as a day laborer working on the docks, as he did, uh, to have then put himself into school, to have learned to read and write, write as the census shows, uh, between 60 and 70, 1860 and 1870, to join the police force in 1871, uh, and to move up to the rank from patrolman up to the rank of an officer. When you say shanty town, however, I get the distinct impression that most of the people who would have been living in there would not be typical and would not be characterized by Quinn. Quinn's unusual because he did it all in one generation. Mm -hmm. But by and large, most of the Irish who lived here in the second generation were moving out. Mm -hmm. uh, they were moving back up into Ohio City, where they were called Lace Curtain Irish. Mm -hmm. uh, they were moving out into the east side. That's the same period during which what had been East Cleveland was brought into the city of Cleveland, the area between 55th and 105th on the east side. And a lot of Irish moved out to there. Uh, in the Irish communities, there's a joke and a difference between the shanty Irish and the lace curtain Irish. Are we really looking at a settlement here that would be characterized by quotation marks shanty Irish? Absolutely. And Absolutely. this means that these are essentially day laborers, basically blue collar folks? Very much so. Very much. Most of them worked within a few hundred feet of where they lived. Many of them worked directly on the docks along the river right. across the street from their houses. And some of them would have been associated with the brewery then, you said before? Many of them were, were, were draymen working to haul kegs of beer back and forth from the brewery, which was about a half a mile. My to question the is, though, that in the brewery indu brewing industry, there are some very skilled and highly skilled and very specialized kinds of jobs. Would they have been held by the Irish as some well? Some of those were held by the Irish, but by the turn of the century, those were jobs being held by 
immigrants from Eastern Europeans, the Czechs, the Hungarians, the East, the East well, what are now East German. What, as I listen to you, what you've done here apparently is pieced together research of your own and other research known through other sources. That's correct. There's what kind of other sources have you looked at? Well, we've worked very closely with historians from the Western Reserve Historical Society and Cleveland State University. Uh, we've looked at census tracts, we've looked at birth records, we've looked at the city directories, we've looked at church registers, mm -hmm. uh, we've tried very hard to go back into things like tax records, but the census data, if we can use them when they are there, and there's one huge 10-year gap in the American census, give us the finest control. They talk about how many people live in a family, what their occupations are, what their ages are, where they came from how much on the average they're earning. It's a great source of information. We want to talk some more about these sources of information and about the other development on them all, and we'll continue our conversation when we return after this message.